Canadian Herpet Culture Podcast. My name is Brandon Milsham. And I'm Kiana Fox. All right, we're live. So welcome everybody who's going to be listening to another episode of Canadian Herpet Culture Podcast. Today I got herpetologist Sherry Book. Bakari with me. Um, hope I pronounced that properly. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So you're in Pakistan right now for some studies and opening up a facility. Mm-hmm. Um, um, right now in Pakistan, uh, my main objective here was to do something about the uh, snake awareness, uh, snake education, uh, let people know about what snakes really are because for now everybody thinks snakes are dangerous or they will result in death so i'm just bringing the new new side of the snake and while i was doing that i happened to upon an opportunity to build the first herpetological center of the country that's super cool so what's the plans with the facility just snake awareness and research or So right now I'm building my main concentration is in snake education. Most of my researches have been on uh, uh, snake ecology related to human settlement. So mainly the impact between human population and snakes and the coexistence and the conflict that that may cause. So that's been pretty much my research about. So I've been focusing a lot in education and my goal right now is to provide snake awareness wherever I can. Uh, schools have been calling me, university students, uh, even private places like uh, houses. I've been doing that in Spain for a while, and I move on to start doing that in Pakistan, where the you know like educational documentaries and all these shows you see in the TV are not that common. So in Spain, we are more exposed to what a snake is that snake use yeah. the tongue for this they don't they won't come and bite your face off once you they see you yeah. so pakistan they don't have that access so i'm bringing that to them here so it's opening the eyes a bit to what snakes really are but pakistan has a lot of snakes and then the center will focus on that uh, giving educational talks having some species in captivity native species so people can see what native animals they have and learn about them. It will also focus on training uh, rescue teams, security team, policemen to handle snakes safely without killing them. Because for now, they all know to do is stick to the head. That's all they know how to do. So um, that's a main uh, concern here is to preserve and conserve the snake's population also by not killing them, just relocating them if they're in a house. And also as a research hub where researchers, university students, geology students or professors can gather samples, tissue samples, blood samples from the animals we have. No, no issue about that. So that's the that's, main focus here. That's really cool. Uh, what are some of the native species of snakes to Pakistan? I honestly don't know because I haven't looked that up yet. So, <laughs> so Pakistan has about 70 species confirmed 70 species of snakes only snakes wow. they have about wow. 70 species uh we have the <laughs> reptiles in general we have the mugger crocodile which is the only confirmed crocodile species in pakistan crocodile palustris we have shelf shell turtles we have the uh, it's a popular tortoise in the market the russian turtles i think they call it the common name Russian tortoise. We have that on the western side of this country. Uh, we have a uh, monitor lizard, two species. We have uh, agamas, we have skinks, uh, snakes. We have cobras, crates, vipers, colubrids, and one Indian python species and chanboas. So a lot of uh, venomous species of snakes that people would be very concerned about if they were to uh, enter their homes or just general areas of people habitating. Yes. Um, indeed. So, so you're telling me that you study uh, spatial ecology. I think I pronounced yes, it. Yes, my last uh, 
did most of my research had been done, had been focused on the spatial ecology of species. I participated in a research in Thailand last two years ago uh, on the spatial ecology of king cobra. That's the research that's ongoing still. It's king cobra research project. Project. Uh, I have helped them out with the research on the king cobra, doing radio telemetry and following the king cobra in the tropical forest, studying the the ecology, the the surrounding ecological surrounding the habits of the snake and through that we will we would have a better understanding on what the snake activity is which is important when the snake activity starts involving human settlements so if we want to preserve the snake it will be best to know about the snake and want to know better about the snake we can convey that information to the local farmers and people living in the area with snake. That will help out in the coexistence of snake and humans. That's actually really cool because I have never heard of people uh, doing that kind <laughs> of study. Uh, in a lot of other countries, snakes do impact a lot of people's lives. Hmm. But whether they are venomous or non-venomous species, and a lot of people don't know how to identify them properly. So having that facility is going to probably help a lot of people and especially the police and everybody yeah. else who deals with these kind of calls that they get. I mean, not only knowing the snake, but they also need to know the importance of why it's like, okay, the snake will do this, the snake will do that, but why should they not kill the snake? So they should know the importance of why shouldn't they kill the snake in which one research I'm kind of tantalizing in my mind, but it's really difficult to to carry through is to do a controlled environment in an agricultural field. Uh, one year, let's let it let have no snakes in that agricultural field. Let's see how it fares out with rat population, mice population, whatever population that goes in there. Just no snakes. Another year, adding snakes and see if that makes a difference in the harvesting later. That would make a difference in my uh see my what i'm expecting is that it would be a better harvesting there will be a better harvesting in the with snake person that would show farmers that having snakes around is actually important for the harvesting job and agriculture okay. fields yeah that'll be pretty interesting once you get more results and stuff uh, it's very difficult because it's not a controlled environment so it's going to be a difficult thing to do but it would be an ideal thing to do yeah, because uh, since it's not a, a controlled environment, you'd need more uh, samples and stuff to make sure you have a large enough sample to get yeah. the right information. Right. Okay. Um, how did you get into herpetology and studying reptiles? Well, it's not uh, it, well, unlike many friends of mine, colleagues of mine in herpetology or keeping reptiles. It's not something that I've been a fast a passionate of since I was a child, like five years old or something. I was uh, fond of animals in general since I first I remember. I mean, I love all kinds of animals. But then as I was finishing my high school, I was thinking, okay, I want to be a zoologist, but I would have to specialize in something. I can't just be generalized. If I want yeah. to go somewhere, I need to specialize in something. And my dream is to discover a new species of animal any new species to discover a new one. So I was saying, OK, uh, my favorite animal is the wolf. That's the, not going to change. The wolf is my favorite animal, but I don't think there will be a new species of wolf hiding out there. It's not the probability is very low. So I was thinking, OK, what groups are there? And this was when I was like 14, 13, 14 years old. And I was thinking, OK, what groups are out there that Still, we don't know much about, and I could discover a new species one day. And I was looking at invertebrates, and they were like, okay, I don't mind tarantulas and scorpions. I would take care of one like it was my child, but I don't want to make a career. And I was thinking of fishes in the deep sea ocean, it be rarely discovered. But yeah, I didn't want to make a career out of that either. Then I look into reptiles and amphibians, and I'm like, oh, okay, they look like dinosaurs. I really like dinosaurs in my childhood. <laughs> so yeah, that's they look cool. So I started reading into it, and I the more I read into it, and this is just like in a one year span, the more I read into it, the more I saw that people were really afraid of them, especially snakes. 
So I'm like, oh, but they look so cool. Why are they so afraid of the snakes? And I started like learning, looking into it, and started reading that snakes are not as scary as people post them to be. I mean, before I used to have that certain respect, like, okay, a snake, let's, let's not go too far with them and everything. But, um, but people are really around me were really, really afraid that they could not see, even see a picture of them. So I'm like, wow, are they that bad? So I started reading more about it, and then eventually I started to learn more about them, and then that pretty much became my goal there, that uh, through my research, through my conservation efforts, through my uh, education efforts, efforts, I would focus more on education, where I would show people, share my experience, share my knowledge on this group of animals that have been highly misunderstood and feared. That's a really great story actually because reptiles in general are just really misunderstood animals and especially snakes because mm -hmm. a lot of snakes are venomous for yeah. whatever evolutionary reason and a lot of people are just afraid of them so mm -hmm. spreading information is just fantastic especially in a lot of countries where there's a lot of venomous snakes and people are just yeah. absolutely terrified of them um one of the comments was, uh, what is the process one would take to become a herpetologist? Because that's probably a lengthy process, I would assume. Well, the process is you can take two ways. The shortest way is to go through university, cover all the degrees, zoology, BSc, MPL, master, PhD, go through all that. The longest way route is to uh, practice, get your basic knowledge in zoology, the BSc. And then from there, you could, I mean, it is a long process, but you could participate from there. You can participate in different researches, different projects, different uh, uh, investigation uh, happening around evolving reptiles and amphibians. And that will give you a little boost on coming up with your own project. And once you come with your own project, you will get the support. You may get, if it's a good one, you may get the support from the university to help you out and pretty much complete your studies pretty much through that. Okay. So uh, roughly how long does that usually take? It's a long process. I mean, the shortest process is going through the formal procedure of studying of the degrees, which would be maybe five, six years top, while the other one might be a bit longer because depending on what researches you participate in, depending yeah. on your contact, depending on the experience you gain, depending that, depending on then you make preparing your own project, then that, depending on if someone is interested in your project wants to help you out with it, then it's all a longer process, but it's still doable. Yeah. Yeah, because I know there's some herpetologists that go for their doctorates. Um, there's another one that I exactly. talked to recently about some Madagascar species that I keep, and uh, he recently got his doctorate, so that's probably a really lengthy process to get that. Mm. Um, I mean, so it's all it's all about getting the knowledge and experience and contact. I mean, the, if you have the knowledge and if, the knowledge on how to fulfill a project properly with collecting data, processing the data, all this you will get in the university. And then if you get the experience in working in the field, co uh, collecting that data physically, uh, chasing the animal, going through the jungle, uh, chopping down vines on the way, going through deserts, uh, falling off the cliff, well, that's my case. I'm kind of uh, clumsy. I'm <laughs> kind of clumsy. A, but, uh, you fell off a cliff? Once, yeah. <laughs> but How'd I, you manage I, that? Well, I was radio. It was when I was radio, track, radio tracking the king cobra, and I, it was nighttime. It was dark in the forest, and I was going through the side of a slope, and I just uh, misstep and I fell on my back, like maybe two meters. Good thing I carried my backpack with me, and it was cushioned with my jacket, which was very hot at that time. So I put it away in my backpack, so I didn't break anything or anything. But I was scary. <laughs> like oh, oh, no doubt. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's all a Gain experience, gain knowledge, and gain getting contact to support you in, in your projects. Yeah, because that'd be a big thing because you have to have reputable people to uh, support your projects and all your uh, publications and stuff that you guys have to do. Yeah, so. I mean, I mean, in my case, for example, I'm graduated from BSc, 
zoology. Okay. But then I spent seven years doing uh, projects, doing getting experience, participating in different projects, different experience, and now I'm pretty much doing my own thing over here. Well, that's cool. Yeah, because it, so, it probably takes a long time before you can start doing your own projects on your own. I, because... start, I started in 2005. So and now I'm just doing my own project just now. Yeah, so it's 15 years to get to where you are now. But Doing the it, long way, after, yeah, pretty much. But it's well worth it in the end. Yeah, I, would I mean, I'm really happy with it. I mean, I was bitten... I was bitten by a venomous snake in Thailand also. I mean, Thailand was really crazy. Everything happened there. But I was bitten by a venomous snake there also. And I mean, if you're interested, I'll tell you a story later. But that was a moment where there was a t moment in the, in the symptom where I was like, OK, game over. But you know what? I don't regret. I don't regret it. I did everything I like to do, and I did everything I wanted to do. But I survived. So here yeah, I yeah. am. That's awesome. It sounds like you got some crazy stories from doing some of your studies. It comes with the experience and all the experience you get and all the travels you do. You do. Yeah. Um, that's also interesting, too, because uh, you do keep some reptiles at home, too, don't you? Or are you used I used to, to anyway? keep a lot of them before starting my, doing my travelings and everything. I used to keep up to 16 animals, mainly snakes. Uh, I really love pythons, and I really love monitor lizards. And I would have kept all possible monitor lizards if I could. But I don't have the space for it, nor the funding for it. But I did try to keep all the pythons possible, all the species of pythons possible in, in captivity. And right now, I only have three reptiles because I'm traveling a lot and here in Spain. So my sister, who I left behind in, in Madrid, uh, taking care of them, she not, she's not capable of taking care of all of them. So I yeah. minimize downside my collection a bit and focus more on the field animals and wild animals. But that knowledge I then bring to keeping them in captivity, which is the more as much as natural as possible. Yeah, because I remember uh, that's how I found you was on Facebook was uh, you did a lot of uh, bioactive setups as exactly we like call, as we like to call them. So with <laughs> that, um, do you think snakes and reptiles in general benefit from enrichment from their environments like that they certainly do they certainly do they don't show it as much as you would expect from mammals or birds they don't they're not they're not good in layman terms they're not good at showing the emotions but they certainly have been a change in becoming more active not being too lethargic not being too lazing around uh, being more active at night. Uh, I definitely saw it in my ball python. It was a snake that used to be in the corner of the enclosure for a long time. I used to have it only, I never had it on the, I always had it on loose substrate. So I always have it like in cocoa peat. Okay. But only cocoa peat, branches, and cave on each side, and a plate of water. And it was just most of the time it moved from one cave to the other. That's pretty much it. You froze. Um, is it okay? Yep, I got you now. Ah, so it was pretty much from one K to the other. It just didn't move much. But now that I put plant in it, put more things, put leaf litter, put invertebrates to do the cleanup inside, it's become he's become more active now. Mainly at night, but at night time you would see him going everywhere. That's that's really cool. Yeah, it's really interesting to see the different keeping methods people do. Some people do bioactive and some people keep them pretty simple. Mm. Um, I keep a lot of my uh, animals uh, semi-bioactive and I do notice a lot of behavioral differences mm -hmm. in what they do from just being on plain Jane setups. So that's uh, really interesting. Yeah, I mean, to me. it's, it's hard. To, I mean, you wouldn't expect them to be in one place in the wild. And I've been seeing that while I was working with them. And now in this pathological center here in Pakistan, I'm pushing the bioactive system also here. So I put my hands on some uh, isopods that I found here in native. So I'm breeding those to be able to later on introduce them in the enclosures. Yeah, that's really cool. I think the bioactive setups are easier maintenance and just overall aesthetically more pleasing. Yeah. Because that's just what I like. Some people don't like that and it's not 
easy cleanup for everybody. So I mean, by active, it's, the thing is keeping on it's closer and naturally, like a natural setup with plants and everything. It's not an easy thing to later on control the hygiene about it, uh, pick up the excrement, the waste, organic waste. But it's and it's understandable. I mean, you have inaccessible place like burrows or behind a plant or in between rock that you won't be able to access. So how do you how do that get clean in the wild? So yeah. you have this team of decomposing uh, uh, the traverse animals, so waste waste, waste consuming animal, invertebrates. So the ideal thing is to put to introduce these in the enclosure to do that job for you. Uh, people can be squeamish about the invertebrates, but uh, just know that you barely see them out in the wild. So you won't yeah. see them in the enclosure that often either. Oop, so, so it's not, I mean, I understand people that might, it might not be for them, so I'm not like pushing it onto everybody. Yeah. But but it's, uh, it's, it's nice to look at, it keeps your animal active. And then for me personally, I, I stop watching documentaries on the TV just to look at my cages every night. <laughs> so, so it's pretty good. Yeah, exactly. Um, I have a couple comments here. Um, Len was wondering, would you do anything different to be where you are right now? Would you do anything different to be where you are now? Um, yeah. I would definitely... I would have definitely, for example, probably finished my career. I would have done that. I would have uh, probably done both things. I mean, I've gone through the experience and field research more, but I would have definitely uh, tried to complete. I'm considering doing that now, but I'm definitely, while I had the chance, would have pursued my career and got that over and done with. That would have opened a lot of more doors, especially here in Pakistan, where uh, your academic degree is much more important than the experience and knowledge you have. So thankfully, I got the support here I needed, but it not wouldn't have it would have been a much uh, foolproof support if I had the academic background behind me. Okay. Oh, another comment here. It's from my co-host. Uh, what inverts do you use in your enclosures? So in my enclosures, I have a. I mean, variety is the best because it's not all the invertebrates, one inverted, one group of invertebrates won't do the same uh, job as the other one. So in order to have a more complete uh, cleanup, uh, I will have a variety of them. So I have isopods, different species, uh, roly polies, uh, wood lice, wood louse, they call them. Uh, I have uh, springtails from the columbola genus. I have a uh, compost worm, earthworm, uh, mealworms. I have uh, the beetles also. I have some cockroaches. But the cockroaches, since they are very, uh, they uh, breed a lot, I keep them with my insectivores. So okay. the insectivores will make sure to control the population of cockroaches. But cockroaches are also, they also feed on organic waste. So they are good to have there. And, and also, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the the ca carrion beetles. I forgot the name now. They're like uh, these, uh, beetles that feed that feed on uh, dead meat. So they will oh, also um, eat. Yeah, and I can't remember the name off that. I don't account. remember the name. I have the beetles. The mested. That's the one. Yeah, those are some of those things are. Cockroaches here in Canada are illegal, except for uh, two, all two them. species. No, there's two species that we recently found out that are legal because they are uh, in Canada. So we, as long as we have proof of where we collected them from, uh, mm -hmm. we, we can keep them um, as long as they're not wild populations, I believe. So mm -hmm. there's that's kind of an, a gray area because that's a controlled by a Canadian food inspection inspectancy agency okay. so okay. because they don't want uh cockroaches and all sorts of bugs to wipe out crops so there's mm. certain things that we have to watch out for here yeah so. yeah i mm -hmm. mean i remember uh, in spain in pakistan there's not there's uh it's still a little bit the gray area what's illegal or what's illegal to keep in captivity 
uh, native species, especially the ones in the red list in IUCN, uh, they are like a big no-no, and you need to have special permits to keep those. Venomous species are frowned upon, but are not illegal per se. And, and as for other animals, invertebrates, anything, it, it can be kept. Spain, illegality as for invertebrates goes. I can't think of any at the moment. So. Okay. Yeah, in Canada, it's, we have provincial laws, so everybody, every province is a little different. So people have yeah. to keep an eye out on what's legal and what's not. So, um, so that's a bit of a pain for yeah. us. Um, so yeah. with, your, with uh, your research and stuff, do you guys notice that um, reptiles recognize their keepers like snakes or lizards? Because I know I keep uh, tegus and they do recognize different people from smells and stuff because they're pretty intelligent lizards. So I mean, the field creatures, we don't interact with the animals as much as if we would keep them in captivity. Yeah. Uh, so they don't get to the point of like recognizing. There are some... Uh, uh, animal reptiles I've seen that, but they're not because we interact with them directly. But for example, we're living in a house in, for Richard, we're living in a house in the middle of the jungle. So sometimes the lizard will come to our kitchen because they know that the invertebrates gather there for the scraps of food. So indirectly, they know that we are a food source and they won't run away from you. I mean, okay. you can pick one up and they will be like, uh, can you put me down? And they, <laughs> And uh, but they won't like run away from you, so they're used to the people, and they know that people don't pose a threat there. A lot, uh, at least we don't. I mean, native might bring up a stick to the head or step on them, but but yeah. uh, researchers, for example, we they know we don't do it. Um, I have a monitor lizard, Bengal monitor lizard in Pakistan here, which is just starting to calm down a bit. He's a uh, local in the in the center I have. I don't have him in. I don't have him in close, but he's like in the. He has a burrow in the, in the open area we have in the center, and mm -hmm. each time I find him on one of the trees, I just come up to him and I can pick him up, and he's like kind of skittish. It's been only like two weeks and a half since I found him, so he's kind of skittish, but he's little gradually calming down. So that's a really cool. So. Uh, kind of proves that reptiles are a lot more intelligent than people make them out to be. Certainly, certainly, they are. Uh, they have the capability of learning, which comes from the high uh, capability of adaptation. Yeah, that's really cool because a lot of people don't think reptiles are very no. smart animals. Only two neurons they have, and I'm like, no, yeah, no, <laughs> not yeah, only no. two neurons. <laughs> Yeah, and reptiles have been found in different various studies to be pretty intelligent and problem solve. Mm. Like I kind of do some activities with my tegus where they kind of problem solve how to get food out of an item. So that's yeah. pretty interesting to watch and mm. watch. And I put different scents and stuff in their enclosures so they can have more um, enrichment things to do. So exactly, that's just yeah, that's just proved the point that. Having given more enrichment to reptiles is actually beneficial for them. Yeah. yeah, I think it's really beneficial to lots of lizards, um, even snakes. Snakes mm. do like to smell other things. So, what every once in a while, I'll put uh, uh, pieces of shed from my other animals into their enclosures, and then they'll kind of check it out and see what this is, and because they want to, they want to make sure that they're it's not a yeah. predator or something. So they're just making sure they're safe. Is what I would think anyway. <laughs> so um what kind of other studies have you done in the past besides uh, the spatial ecology yeah. i mean i've done my bsc in animal studies and then i focus on herpetology pretty much after that after doing my bsc i pretty much uh, participate in every research program every conference held rep related to reptile especially snakes which is what i'm focusing within reptiles i'm focusing my uh my efforts on the snake populations. Um, I haven't done pretty much after, apart from that. I've done some courses, some uh, like online courses, uh, punctual courses of that, like three, six months, which you do like a three month theoretical and then you do some practicals in the zoo or 
uh, and aquarium. So I've done a few of those. I've done some theory code on uh, captive management of apes, captive management of marine mammals, captive management of, uh, of course, reptiles. Uh, I did a short veterinary course also, and that's mainly because I was interested to, I mean, not to go in depth with veterinary, like all the surgery and everything, yeah. but at least if something happens to my animal to be able to recognize the symptoms. Yeah. Do some symptom diagnosis and some basic first aid before if something major were to happen. Yeah. Which I think that's very important for a lot of people to have as a reptile based first aid kit in case yes. an animal receives I mean, a large cut or whatever. So yeah, I mean that prevents people from panicking and because even dogs and cats, I mean even if they do can complain, they can't tell us what's wrong. Yeah. My head hurts, my stomach hurts, something like that. So it is kind of, I think, I feel it's important. This is why I did this course, uh, just a one year course in veterinary. Um, that's why I did to recognize, I did it focus on exotic animals to have a little bit more information on reptiles, especially since that's what I'm mainly keeping. So, so that's pretty much what I did. Not much after that. More, most of my, Knowledge and experience come from physical work and not that much studies. Okay. Yeah, because I for I keep large lizards and I keep a couple of them, so they're very clumsy and they hurt themselves quite often. So <laughs> I have my own first aid kits in case they cut themselves or whatever. So I have okay. gives myself a couple hours before or a couple of days before I can get in to see a vet, which I think hmm. a lot of people um overlook it's one of those things that people don't think about all the time so i mean that's also good that when you take it to the vet i mean i'm not down talking any vet i have veterinarians who are very good friends of mine and i trust their word for it and they are very good vets actually but there are some vets for example that will make a big issue out of something that's not a big issue so this knowledge also helps to like uh okay for example then let me give you a case my corn snake I don't have him with me anymore. I gave him, gave him to a friend of mine. But uh, when I had a coin snake, he had some like uh, bumps on the on the side. And like the lower half of the body was kind of swollen. So I'm like, okay, uh, I touch it because uh, corn snakes are known for pathogenesis. So they can replicate themselves pretty much. So I was wondering if there were eggs in there because it was a female. So I was okay. wondering if there was eggs in there. So I touched him, but no, they were too soft. So I took it to the vet, took her to the vet to see what it was, to get the scan, to get the 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 MRI and get the X-ray to see what it was. And it seemed apparently it's like the uh, if I remember correctly, the the lipid acid from the liver had been like uh, accumulating a lot and leaking out a little bit on the rest of the body. Okay. So it's something that uh, either the, the doctor was saying it looked quite serious, you need to cut it open, we need to do surgery, cut it open, drain the liquid, and then sew her up again. And I hold on a moment. Uh, I mean, this is, I mean, I recognize from, I remember from my uh, my surgery that this is something that, I mean, I, I thought it would be like stones or something like that, or something like a, a in, inner hemorrhaging, inner bleeding. Something okay. like that. Hemorrhage. But the condition he was describing, what I was seeing in the re in the results, is just something that with a with a just a nice uh, without handling the snake a lot, stressing the snake too much, and giving a uh, stop feeding it for a while, the eventually it will pass on its own. So okay. that for me is less stressful than having to submit the snake to surgery, yeah, cut it open, and then drain it all, and yeah. So uh, that's under something, anesthesia. and anesthesia is like a 50 chance that a snake might survive that or not. Yeah, exactly. So I'm like, yeah, I, I take it back home, let's give it another two weeks. And if in another two weeks it doesn't go down, then I'll bring it back again. Yeah. Took it back home and it can, became completely normal after a week and a bit. Yeah, that's a definitely an interesting case. Um, I got, I'm lucky. I got some really good reptile vets where I am. Um, uh, 
excuse me. I had to take mm-hmm. my Tegu in for a tail amputation because part of his tail start, uh, like oh, broke. Because okay. I think yeah, he broke it in his enclosure on something or mm-hmm. trying to lift himself up. So the blood flow stopped and it started rotting. So I had to take him to get an amputation. I went and seen my vet. She agreed with what I said. And the surgery went well. And That's he, good. Yeah, I was really happy because anesthesia with any reptile is very dangerous yeah. because there's 50-50 chance that either they're going to wake up or they're not. So mm. I was pretty happy that he was able to recover and he's doing great now. So it's just That's good. Things, it's one of yeah. those things people have to, not everybody is going to understand or know everything about different uh, veterinary practices and stuff like that. So it's good to have a really good vet so you can talk with them and understand yeah. i mean if it's also each person it's, it's a good idea to have at least some kind of like understanding when something is serious yeah and when something or like you might not have the experience to undergo the procedure or the treatment yourself like surgery or something yeah but at least you would should have the knowledge on the procedure or something that at least know how it should be done just so you know so you don't you're not like out of the loop also. Oh, Lem is uh, got a couple of questions. How is keeping reptiles on your side of the world? Do people love breeding ball pythons as much as they <laughs> do here? <laughs> uh, in my side of the world. So, I mean, Spain, for example, uh, has banned ball pythons now. Oh, really? Yeah, it's for the stupid reason. I mean, my... They banned it under the pretense of it being an invasive species. Hmm. And to be honest, Spain is very cold in winter and very hot in summer. Yeah. yeah so it's, summer it's, is fine, but winter we get, uh, I don't know the Fahrenheit, I know the Celsius, but Spain we get um, easily, in most part of the country, we get below 10 degrees Celsius, which is really cold. So ball pythons are not likely to survive much less breed there no but still they pass it down it will be invasive species along with the savannah monitor lizards and moss monitor lizards uh they pass it down as invasive species so ball python right now is banned we it's been a big market ball python for long, many years so many people do keep ball python me myself included but uh we can't buy anymore we can't get any more new ones oh, okay and so in that's... pakistan uh, I haven't been here. I've only been here for six months, so I haven't like fully explored the whole country yet. And my main focus has been on the native species. But uh, I know in the south city of the country there are some reptile people there, and I do know some reticulate pythons, Burmese pythons, boas, constrictors. I Pretty sure I saw some ball pythons there, but I don't think it's as big as it would be in the Western countries. Yeah, it's ball pythons are mm-hmm. a huge market here. Um, and Lem was asking what vet I used. I used uh, Calgary Avian and Exotic, and I used Dr. Kelsey Chapman. And I've also used uh, Duotin Vet Clinic, which was Dr. Ava. And both great vets. If people are in the Calgary area looking for vets, I recommend those two. Um, yeah, I'm having a brain fart. I have another question. <laughs> oh, Lem's wondering where you're from, and you are from Spain, correct? Yeah, born in Madrid, Spain, raised in Madrid, Spain, but my parents are from Pakistan, so I came back to my home country pretty much to work here. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so what kind of native species are you looking for in Pakistan? Because I uh remember you posting about your trip before you left and you're going to take some pictures of uh, leopard geckos to prove that they're not on yeah, that, <laughs> uh, Damn virus. Uh, yeah, that's a little bit of going up in, a, in the air. Hopefully things get better in Pakistan, which I'm not, it's not likely that's going to get better that soon. I mean, at least because my trip back to Spain is scheduled for May. I'm just going back for, I mean, when I was before coming to Pakistan, I didn't have any idea I would be doing all this. I just okay. came here to scout a bit what possibilities of doing a research project of my own, and everything is possible here. So I've been going up and down the country a bit, but not much being able to help a lot because that was in winter. 
and yeah. winter you don't get much activity here but okay. i was i came in winter for the purpose of uh, being able to concentrate on gaining experience uh, not experience but contacts and places to to be before actually having to go and get reptiles and rescue snakes and stuff like that so right now uh, the trip was made for just to last six months so i've been completing the six months now in may but and i'll be going back to madrid but since i have this project now like it's starting to stabilize here in pakistan so i'll be coming back eventually when everything blows out i'll be able to come back here and then hopefully we'll be able to resume my herping trips i'll be looking for the leopard geckos i've been asking around and they've been saying, oh, yes, we can take you there and we'll find lots of them. We can take you there and we'll find lots of them. So I know the places now where to find them. But I just can't go right now. And hopefully I'll be able to go when I come back. Yeah, that'll be really cool. Um, I recently actually just watched a video of some people looking for leopard geckos. And it was pretty neat to see uh, what kind of environment they're from. Because it yeah. seemed like it was more of a, a clay type uh, substrate. And, uh, it's really mostly rocky. by what they I've been told here by people who actually saw them and live in the habitat. It's mostly rocky area, shrubby area, rocky. And many people are in Spain. They have the notion that the leopard gecko is completely sand. But that's yeah, wrong. Yeah, they're not a desert species. They're kind so of. They're not uh, a complete. There's a dry habitat, but like complete rock, barely any vegetation. Uh, some species have been found on edge of the forest, but still dry forest, not tropical species. Yeah. But it's not a desert species, not a sandy area. So it's kind of more of an arid environment. Exactly. So, yeah, because that's how I kind of keep mine is pretty arid and uh, mm. lots of lots of nooks and crannies for them to hide in. I layer lots of rocks so it creates different. Ah, uh, that's the proper way. Hmm. And that's how I like to keep mine. They're happy. They're healthy. Um, they seem to be doing well. So, because I got three of them as pets, and they're just great animals if you take care of them properly <laughs> and that's a lot of misinformation out on the internet too these days but not everybody likes to keep them natural lots of people like to keep their animals yeah um very um i mean sterile. i was talking with some researchers that been working with some lizards in pakistan they're not herpetologists because they don't specialize it but they've been doing some work about them in the natural science museum here in pakistan and they had a lot of uh preserved specimens of leopard geckos for study in the collection of preserved species and i told them how this species is like have very lots of uh misinformation about how they keep them what the natural habitat looks like people keep them in sand and when i said that people keep them in sand they look at me like oh, what? they don't live <laughs> like that and i'm like oh, yeah i know i know don't worry yeah i'm yeah. here to to share that information <laughs> Yeah, that's it's really good. Like the information's out there that they don't live on sand, but for whatever reason, people still believe that they live on sand. Because they think Pakistan is all desert. But it's, it's not. not. I mean, there are parts of Pakistan which are sandy. That's where you pretty much find the sand boas and the mm -hmm. uh, soft scale vipers. But it's not all desert. And leopard geckos are normally within the country. They're mainly on dry rocky hard soil areas oh that's a good question kiana um kiana's wondering if there's any naturally occurring morphs of leopard geckos in the wild if you know that albinos have been found and they've been found albinos and uh aberrant patterns i mean i don't know i'm not very familiar with the morphs of geckos that you have right now they're like for me they're like three thousand like the ball python they're like three thousand morphs now yeah, there's, so there's I lost count. too many. I lost count. <laughs> but definitely in between the specimens found here, we've seen, I've seen, I mean, I haven't seen the wild specimens, but the preserved specimens in the museum, uh, I've seen there have been albinos. And there have been a few that are not like uh, the normal patterns. They're kind of like apparent, like an abnormal pattern. But I don't know I would call them. I can't recognize any morphs like, to tell them, like, this is, Definitely not something striking like snow or blizzard or tangerine. Yeah. Although maybe tangerine, I don't know. Right now. I would have to. I would have to look it up. But. Yeah, I, I would assume that there's it'd be it'd be definitely be random because it's not going to be um, 
detect. Yeah, I mean the most the most uh, common moth mutation to see in the wild is albino, and they don't last very long because anybody can off. see them. Yeah, get picked off by a predator. What yeah. are some of the predators of uh, leopard geckos in the wild? Oh, leopard, definitely monitor lizards, snakes, uh, birds of prey, and any small mammal like mongoose or weasels. Not weasel, but they're like a kind of uh, definitely mongoose or civets. That's the name I would look for, civets. So they mm -hmm. would definitely come and eat them, but mostly monitor lizards. That's really cool because I had no idea what the predators of leopard geckos were. Hmm. <laughs> that's that's something I've never looked up and never thought about until actually right now. I've been very interested in the predator prey relationship between mainly snakes. So I'm always happy, even if the snake ends up being the prey, it is a little hard blow for me since I like snakes a lot, but it's always really an interesting observation for me to see either a snake being eaten by something or a snake eating something. Yeah. So if I, in one of my explorations, I do find like a predator prey sequence on leopard geckos, I would definitely document it. That'd be cool. Um, with your king snake study, uh, not your king snake, king cobra study, um, mm. uh, did you see any predators hunting the king, uh, king cobras? Or we, did they have any predators? We, they do have predators, mainly they kill the most, they're mainly killed by humans, by us. Yeah. But like non-human predators would include, um, uh, when they're younger, they have a lot of predators. There can be other snakes, like crates, other cobras, uh, monitor lizards, birds of prey, uh, like uh, eagle snakes, so and mongoose also. So they would have, but when they're adults, we're talking about uh, more than three meter long, Snake uh, the main predator is a bigger king cobra. Okay, that's so we've had a. I I wasn't present in that time, but we had a king cobra we were tracking, and that king cobra we were tracking was inside another king cobra we never found before. <laughs> but that was interesting. <laughs> that was a surprise. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't present there, but they told me about it. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's cool. I guess. So. The king cobra that you're tracking got eaten. So with the radio tracker, eventually... Yeah, we put a transmitter inside the body. We do a surgery, surgery intervening. Uh, we put a transmitter inside the body. We stitch the snake up. And we, after the anesthesia is gone, we release the snakes. And, uh, and then we radio track it using the radio telemetry. We use a radio receiver and a radio antenna to track the snake, follow its movement. And... With that, study the movements of the snake, the harder use of the habitat, what interactions it has with the surroundings, pretty much all that. That's really cool. So the one that got eaten, did the radio transmitter make its way out of the other snake? Yes, we had to follow that snake and eventually, because it's not like inside the, the skin layer, not like inside the muscle layer. So it would definitely pass out and we would have to recover it. But they are expensive equipment. Yeah, so we follow that thing to recover it. I bet. Um, <laughs> a couple questions from the live. Uh, what monitor SP are in Pakistan? Well, we have two species. We have a Bengal monitor, Varanus bengalensis, which is the most common one. Uh, they're like a very common. When I say common one, they're very common. You see them almost everywhere. And we have the yellow monitor lizard, Varanus flavescens, which is uh, restricted to the southern, southwestern side of the country. Not very accessible because it's kind of like a unsafe area, but okay. they can be found. That's pretty cool. Another comment. Uh, can cobras be envenomated by other cobras or are they immune to the toxins? In most, of, in most of the cobra species, in the diet also consists of other snakes. Their venom are effective on other snakes also, even their own. So in most of the cobra species, crate species, their venom can uh, uh, put down any other snakes of their own species so they can eat them. But that's that mainly makes... because snakes are part of their diet, main diet. And crates, for example, snakes are their only diet. So they will need a venom to be able to immobilize 
uh, snake because venom of a snake is used for uh, making the prey out of combat. So uh, immobilizing is not mainly uh, created for killing, but it's mainly created for immobilizing. Now, if your body is really allergic and sensitive to the venom, it will kill you. Yeah. But otherwise, it, the numbing, the feeling of uh, un, not control of your movements, that's the main objective of the venom, to paralyze the prey, pretty much. Immobilize oh. the prey. That, that makes a lot of sense, because it would just be easier to eat that prey item if it can't move. Exactly. So... Um, Lem is wondering how far do they travel? So in your radio, um, t- oh, King Cobra t- have traveled a long way. I mean, right now, let me. I had here. Uh, I had here the information about it. I don't have it on me right now, but they did travel a lot. Uh, for example, we would radio tracking King Cobra, and there was another team radio tracking the the more. The cobra from the Naja genus. So, spitting cobras and the monocle cobra. Okay. So, while we were radio tracking the king cobra, they were tracking these other two species of smaller species of cobra. So, they commented that the small, the Naja genus, they move a lot. They stayed in, they stayed in, in one place for a very short time and they move a lot, but short distances. While we noticed that the king cobra will remain in one place maybe for a long time either maybe shedding or digesting a meal or maybe none of those, but it will stay there for at least a week. And then it will go for maybe one or two kilometers away. Hmm. That's pretty far away. Yeah. I don't know how to convert that in miles, but uh, two in kilometers is like one or two kilometers per time. In, in Canada, we use Celsius in kilometers. So oh, okay. Mo- mo- most of the viewers <laughs> don't understand that. So. All right, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's actually really cool. I didn't think they would uh, travel that much. Yeah, they do actually. I don't. If you want later on in your in your, uh, I can send you in, through your message the article about the research they've done there. So that'd be awesome. We can post it to our page, mm-hmm. and uh, other people can read some of that information if they want to. Yep. That's yeah. That's actually really awesome. I'd be intrigued into reading more about that. It was pretty interesting that some species uh, move a lot more, and then remain stationary for a long time to probably recover from all that movement while other species are moving a lot more uh times but shorter distance yeah but kind of does make sense because if one area becomes pretty sparse in feeders then they would want to move to another area so they can hopefully find a food exactly yep the bigger they are the more spe- the more area they have to cover and they don't want to expel some species don't want to expel too much energy. So they'll do short distances and then conserve energy and then mm-hmm. move again. So that, 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 that does make a sense to me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, is there, are you going to be studying any species in Pakistan while you're there or just doing, I'll research? be concentrating in the venomous species and pretty much, uh, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on the, on the on the awareness of the snake, but once that is all down and running, then I will start my research project, and that would be done will be done mainly on the species I am more interested in, when the either the python, the venomous species, or the monitor lizard, or all three of them, one after the other. Okay, I'll be mainly trying to work on these species. That'll be cool. Uh, I think Lem missed it, but she's uh, wondering what projects you're currently working on. So right now, I'm very much working on the awareness of snakes. So I'm giving out uh, uh, educational talks about snake species to the local people who are not uh, really uh, exposed to our side, our view of a snake. So they think snakes equal to death and snakes are dangerous. All snakes are dangerous, even harmless ones. Recently, uh, and it's also something that really bugs me that every picture someone Pakistani sent me to identify a snake they found, all snakes are dead. I mean, yeah, they killed the snake beforehand. 
Yeah. So they it should be I'm trying to like change that notion that you don't need to kill a snake. And you can take a picture of a snake without killing it. So yeah. that's something I want to like uh, convey to them, showing them a new side. And I've been doing it for a while now and the 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 expectations I got is the audience I got was like really they were like mind blown. They're like, really a snake is all that? It's not gonna bite your face off? And I'm like, no, no, no. This is what a snake actually is. If you leave it alone, it won't do anything to you. Even a cobra or even a viper, you just leave it alone, it won't do anything to you. And I've been working with vipers in November, for example, before the cold spell, before winter fell. I got a chance to see a few snakes in Pakistan. So I just went out from one day, and that one day I found five species of snakes. So that was pretty cool. So my main focus would be educational focus, but then I also would like to do uh, rescue like form a team to do rescues on snakes. So people call us saying, we have a cobra in our kitchen. Can you come and take it? So that would be a big step into that person going themselves and killing the snake. They would call us, but we can retrieve the snake safely and, and release it later. But we we would need to train team for that. So that's what my center is also about. This project is also about training rescue teams, security teams, anybody who would be uh, rescuing snakes. And then, uh, the project also would like would uh, eventually work on the anti-venom production, snake bite and treatment and anti-venom production. So for anti-venom to be made, we need the samples of venom from the snakes in Pakistan. Now we there is not a, a big movement of anti-venom. There is anti-venom in Pakistan, but it's very scarce. There's not. I, and I don't, and I still haven't been able to go to the center providing them. I don't have, they haven't let me in yet. But okay. I can't figure out why they are not being able to do a good fluid production of anti venom, especially with all the snake bites that happened in Pakistan. Around 40,000 snake bite cases a year in Pakistan. 40,000. That's quite a few. And Especially those are the reported for... ones. We don't know how many go unreported. Yeah. And uh, maybe a ratio every six, every sixty-four bytes, maybe one death. So out of those forty thousand, every sixty-four bytes, every sixty-four bytes, you have one death from the snake bite. And it's mainly due to not being able to access to a snake antivenom or treatment. So the antivenom treatment in Pakistan is not going that smoothly, and. Right now, the hospitals that can do the treatment, they get the antivenom mostly from India. But India, although the India antivenom is for the same species as the one in Pakistan, venom is a very complex, uh, it's very complex. So yeah. once there's, even if the same species, one is in a different locality, especially different country, then the reaction is totally different. So for example, uh, antivenom for a species in uh, for example, the Indian cobra. The antivenom for the Indian cobra in India, it will take maybe one hour. I mean, I'm just giving a, an example, not a exact data. Yeah. It will maybe take one hour to uh, to stabilize your, your condition. Okay. And then in Pakistan, it will take two hours instead of one hour. So mm -hmm. it's not the same. It's not as efficient. And that is if it's efficient. Sometimes yeah. it's not efficient at all. Even though it's for the same species, it's not for the same country. So Pakistan needs anti-venom for their Pakistani snakes. And for that, we need the venom sample from for the snakes of this country. So that would be one other project I have to be able to have a good surplus of venom sample to supply to laboratories to make the anti-venom. Yeah, that'll be really cool because I was I actually watched the venom interviews the other day again. Yeah, and, that's uh, a good wood one. It, it is a really good video because it uh, gave me a lot of information that I didn't know about venoms. Like, as mm. you were saying, different localities can have different uh, venoms because it's just a different compound compared to other yep. animals in the same species because it might need a little bit of something else to uh, subdue its prey. And even even different person have a different reaction to the venom. I might be bitten by a hog nose snake. And I might have a rattlesnake symptoms to it. You might be bitten by a hog nose snake and you'll be fine. So it's different reaction yeah. body wise. Different. Yeah, I, I got a lot of Madagascar species of hog noses. I have the giants, the speckleds, and the. Oh, lawns. those are nice ones. Yeah, I, 
I absolutely love the species. I've been bit by my uh, giant hatchlings that I produced a lot. And um, I haven't had any reactions. Well, I've had minor reactions. I had a little bit of swelling here and there and a little pain in the joints because they bite my fingers. I have mm -hmm. not been bit by the adults or the speckleds. And I seen a study that the speckleds, um, they envenomated some rats, mice, and rabbits. And the insides turned up basically liquid and it was mm. just a sack of skin on the outside so um i don't want to know what that might do to me it could be nothing yeah. or it could be something major i mean it's when they're doing the testing on the lethal dose of a venom they do it mainly on mice and although mice are not human so we can't really expect the same hundred percent the same symptoms as yeah. the mouse but they're still mammals, so those are closer we get. That's why we're testing them on mice, because they are still mammals and we are mammals, so we can kind of have an idea, but it's not going to be the same symptom we would yeah. get, either for worse or for better. So we don't know, like, for example, with your case, you don't know if they bit you, you would be worse off than the mouse or rabbit or rat, or you would be better off. So yeah, it's just yeah, an it's just... unnecessary risk to be bitten by any snake, pretty much, because any snake with some kind of venomous component can always give us a price. Yeah, because you don't know if you're going to be allergic to those proteins that are in its venom. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, me, for example, I used to be very careless in captive species. And when I was captive uh, keeping the animal back in the day when I was working in the zoos and in the uh, reptile breeding centers, I used to be very careless. And I used to be bitten by pythons, used to be bitten by colubrids, uh, boas, a lot. And I didn't care because, hey, she's not venomous, I don't care. But now that I'm working with uh, wild animals, uh, even though they're not venomous, they might have some kind of, uh, I might be uh, having some allergic reaction because you don't know what's in the mouth from what they're eating in the yeah. wild. There could be some in bacteria. Captive, you have a controlled environment. Yeah, in captive, you have a controlled environment, so you know what you're feeding the snakes. But in the wild, you don't know what they've been feeding on. So even though they're harmless, I try to avoid when I can having a bite from a snake in the wild. Yeah, uh, that reminds me of your envenomation that you had in Thailand. <laughs> how, how did that go? <laughs> uh, that was a funny story now that you think about it. It was scary then, but it's funny now. It yeah. was The species was a coral snake, the Ooh. Asian coral snakes. So coral snakes, unlike the ones in the US, the Asian ones are not that known. The genus name is Calliophis. So the, Amer the American continent one, the Microus, those are well known. We know pretty much the symptoms of the venom. We know we have antivenom for them. Yeah. And so we know what to expect. The Asian ones are not properly studied. And it's Brian Fry, Dr. Brian Fry, uh, Australian herpetologist, uh, expert in venom. Uh, he is. Uh, he started working on it some time ago. He started working on this species, on this genus, or uh, Asian coral snake. So this happened on my first month of uh, of being in Thailand. Out of the six months I was going to be there, this happened on my first month. So I was going to uh, normally keep radio checking king cobra is a one person thing, but in the one month you go with a veteran with someone more experienced in it, so you learn the ropes pretty much. And then you're expected to do the radio tracking on your own afterwards. So this was like kind of like my first time about to go on my own. And radio tracking King Cobra is done four times a day in a time of every four hours. So you don't finish your tracking until you find the snake. So like I said before, sometimes the snake remains stationary. So you just yeah. go to the ways you found it last time and if the snake is still there, you take the data and then you're done. You don't take that much long. You don't take that much time. But if you go to where you last found it and you find out that the snake has moved, you got to go after it. Yeah. And sometimes the snake has moved really far and not only really far, it might have gone up the mountain, down the mountain, through valley, through river. It's gone everywhere. So you won't be done until the, the snake is found. So maybe if you start at 6 o'clock in the morning, and you go there and the snake is there, fine, everything's done, you'll be done by 6.30. Then four hours after that, you do the next one. Okay. So, but if you go there at 6 o'clock in the morning, the snake has moved and you don't find the snake till 9 o'clock. 
for example. So you take three hours to find a snake. Yeah. So nine o'clock, four hours after that instead. But so and then that if you go to, if you take too long, you might your last tracking might end up in the night. And going out in the jungle at night is not that fun at all, especially if you're going alone. Yeah. So so it, it is fun but if you're going in a group, but if you're going alone, it can be kind of uh, unnerving at some times. Yeah. So I try to go as soon as possible, but uh, it can't be helped. The snake has moved, so you just need to do it. But if I get there earlier as possible, then that at least helps something. So I was in a hurry in the, in the month. I was in a hurry, but I had to go to the bathroom. So I went to the bathroom, and the snake was in, at the toilet. <laughs> and I didn't what? see it. I was like putting my hand to try to get uh, to get to lift the toilet seat, and the snake was under there. And I felt this thing, and I lifted my hand up, and the snake was still hanging on the on the finger, on the finger. So I just shook my hand. It fell to the ground. I'm like, oh my god, a snake bit me. Now what I going to do? I don't know. I didn't recognize the snake at that time. I didn't know what species it was. Ooh. But I'm like, I'm in a tropical country, Southeast Asia. It could be really venomous. And I, I got screwed myself up. Yeah. So I'm like uh, trying to figure out what kind of species it is. And then suddenly the snake started to lift the tail and show the red underside, which is typical of the coral snakes in Asia. That's what they do to tell you, hey, stay away from me, I'm venomous. I'm going to bite you. Okay. So he was trying to do the tail defense that he would hook the tail upwards. And I'm like, ah, shit, that's like a coral snake. I've been bitten by a coral snake. Oh. And then the, but then I remember that there's another harmless snake, the kukri snake, the oligodon, that they do the same thing. That's a, that's a mimic mimic cry that they do. They imitate the same behavior to cause snakes or people and predators think it's a venomous snake and leave okay. it alone, but it's harmless. So I'm like, oh wait a minute, maybe it's a kukri snake, maybe it's a harmless one. But and this all about um, I've been bitten by a venomous snake. And I'm still there trying to figure out what species it is. And <laughs> so I was like, no, it doesn't look like a kuri snake to me. So yeah, probably a coral snake. So I pick it up, I push it into I didn't pick it up, I pushed it into a Tupperware. And I took it to my supervisor and I said, Hey Mike, can you uh, confirm what species of snake this is? Oh my god, sorry, this is a coral snake. What you I haven't seen one in the two years I've been here. And I'm like, uh I was already getting goosebumps. And I'm like, are you sure it's a coral snake? It's not a cuckoo snake? No, no, that's definitely a coral snake. Look at the patterns, everything. You were very excited. That's definitely a coral snake. Mm -hmm. I've been bitten. <laughs> are you serious? And I'm like, yes. And I showed my finger, and my finger was really swollen at that time. So then after that, it was like a uh, race against time to uh, get me to the hospital, get the car to get me, get me to the hospital, and see if they have treatment there. Uh, since this species was not... Uh, uh, this, uh, the genus itself, they were not uh, studied enough. There was no antivenom for it, pretty much. And we don't know what symptoms to expect. So I was scared. I was like, I was calm. I know that the first thing you need to do when you get bitten by a snake, venomous snake, is remain calm. Easier said than done. But the more, uh, ex the more nervous you get, the more panicky you get, the worse it gets. So if you remain calm, then it's better. And so I remained calm, but I was still very nervous in my mind because I did not know what symptoms to expect. If I was bitten by a cobra or a Russell viper, I would be more calm and less panic and less like interior panicky because I know yeah. what symptoms to expect from it, even though it could be certain death. But I didn't know what, but in this case, it could be certain death, but I didn't know what symptoms to expect from it. So I didn't know if yeah. I was going to have a cardiac arrest or brain. Uh, shock in the next five minutes or what? Yeah, I'm gonna stop breathing in the next five minutes or what? So I was there. The car came. They took me in the car. I started feeling like numbness in the throat and numbness under the eye, and the joints of my fingers started hurting. So that moment, I was like, "Okay, this is game over." Then, but if it's game over, I'd have no regrets. I've done everything I wanted to do, and I, and I'm happy with everything I've done. And when we got to the hospital, and there was no antivenom, they we want, they wanted, they were, think, they were thinking of giving me a cobra antivenom. But that can be equally bad because it's not really for the snake and the antivenom yeah. itself, if I'm allergic to it, it can kill him. So we, 
we actually took the snake with us to show them, look, it's not a cobra because there's an Indian uh, language barrier there. So yeah. they might not understand English enough to like uh, see. So we showed them what snake it was. So in the end, I was submitted under, uh, under uh, what? IV, <clears throat> IV uh, hydration, uh, like uh, saline, and then the antibiotic. And just two days of antibiotic, and I started uh, getting better after that. After two days, I was uh, discharged from the hospital. I went back to the research station. I did not do any research field until a week later because my finger joint was still hurting for like another month. Okay. So, so until then, I wasn't going out to the field. But after that, I just went back to normal after that. That's quite the situation. And that's pretty much uh, emphasizes that we need to know more about the snake, even especially the venom component, because at least now I've uh, written an article with pending publishing about the snake bite uh, situation. Okay. But, uh, but so now someone else gets bitten by the snake because nobody w was bitten by the species before me. Yeah. There was nothing written about it. So I had nothing to like rely on, like uh, something to uh, have some reference on it. So now if someone gets bitten by the species again, at least he will have my reference to base on. But like I said, it's a very complex thing. So it might, I might have a different symptom to someone else getting bitten by one. Hmm. Yeah, well, at least there's some more information about them now. It's not under the ideal circumstances, but <laughs> well, you never know. For science, get bitten by a venomous snake. <laughs> it's for science. For science. <laughs> that kind of makes me uh, double question my wanting to get some this uh, very recently found a uh, rear fang venomous snake um, from. Uh, Madagascar. It's a. Uh, there's not much information about it. It's uh, Peristenophis bestilianus. Mm -hmm. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm not sure. Um, it's a really appealing species to me. They're an arboreal species, and they're supposed to be rear fang venomous. And from the other herpetologist that I talked to, he says they're super cool. But there's no information about their venoms or anything. So mm. it's kind of a risky situation. So if uh, do even get if it's a uh, even if it's a red fang, it still it can kill you. I mean, just look it, at a boom slang. Boom yeah, slang exactly. is red fang, it can kill you. And the African vine snakes, uh, teratornis, they can cause death also, and they're also a red fang. So it's just something when it comes to snake bites, you're in for surprises. I mean, the coral snake, coral snakes are known for being lethal, and I survive and not had that much of a reaction to it. Yeah. Well, it would just all depend on how much of a dose you get and how much dose is needed for those that, are factors, uh, but it's much more deeper than that. Yeah. Yeah. So like uh, in the venom interviews, they went over a, a lot of that kind mm. of stuff. So that really broadened the information that I didn't know about venoms and how they interact with their prey items or people. So yeah. For people that haven't watched that, it's still for free. If you check out the Venom interviews page, because Ray Morgan did it for free, if you put in the password, so people can watch it currently, since we're all stuck in quarantine. <laughs> yes, Ray Morgan has done a very good table for us stuck in the quarantine. Yeah, so it's a very good, great educational video. There's some very interesting stuff in there about like some people keeping venomous snakes when they're kids, which I don't recommend, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, there's lots of great information about venoms and stuff like that. And yeah, so that's pretty cool. Um, so any other future studies that you plan besides this stuff in Pakistan for the facility and everything? So right now I'm focused in Pakistan because Pakistan seems to be uh, working out. If, I did not manage to pull anything out in Pakistan. Then I would just uh, continue participating in different projects and research to gain experience, knowledge. You can never know too much. No. So get more experience, get more knowledge, get more contact. I might revisit all uh, ongoing researches just to uh, tackle them with much more experience than I had before and much more knowledge than I had before. Uh, 
maybe uh, indigo expedition from Roland Griffin in Guatemala. I would be very uh, happy to go back to them again. Uh, probably go back again to King Cobra research project again at some point. And I would like to concentrate a lot in Africa and Australia. Those are two good places to be. I've been to with Living Geology doing the documentary on venomous snakes in Uganda just uh, last year. So Africa has very interesting species there. But Pakistan seems to be working also as, and they have a lot of potential and lots of species to work with here. So I'll see what I can do here and uh, move on from that, from there. Definitely yeah. going to do like surveying, surveying, definitely surveying what species are in this country. The Pakistan has a book on the reptiles and snake species in Pakistan. But there's a book on snake species, but the snakes last, the book was published last, the last edition was 2002. So oh, it's really outdated. Yeah. So doing a new book, uh, writing up a new book with the new uh, data on the species of snakes, snakes in Pakistan would be another project I might do. But for that, I need to travel. And yeah. the virus did not let me do that. So, <laughs> well, hopefully you can get back to your studies. Uh, and hopefully, finding it and all that that'd be really cool. Because uh, an updated book on species and identification. Because who knows, there might be something that you might find that's hasn't been identified. You yet. never know. So, because there's everywhere they're finding new species. There's um, lots of yep. species. That so would be I mean, a dream come true then if I discover a new species. So you never know. Well, that's a big step for all, any herpetologist is when they're out studying animals and they discover a new species. That's a really big thing for you guys. Yes. It's like a really main goal up there. Not, maybe not for everybody, but for, at least for most of us. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, What kind of publications have you done? I just only done one publication right now, uh, pending and publishing the snake bite ca case. Okay. And then the other publications have just been not a uh, official formal publication, but some articles are written like the ones you've been following in the Bioactive search. So just those small uh, online articles. Okay. Um, well, I'm looking forward to that uh, new publication that you'll be coming out with. That'll be interesting to have. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, definitely. That's a, uh, Kiana's got a question. What is your biggest achievement as a herpetologist? It's mainly as a herpetologist, for me, my biggest achievement has been uh, uh, showing, definitely showing someone who's really like really disregarded snake, really had a phobia for snakes, really could not see a snake, and managing to get that someone to actually come and ha hold a snake, handle a snake, and touch a snake and actually come to me like, wow, this is actually pretty cool. So that's for me, is like one big achievement for me. And it's happened a few times, but it's like, for me, it's like that's the biggest reward I've gotten in my career as a herpetologist in the educational side. So I haven't done any, uh, like, like uh, now, for example, when I, if this comes running, then if this dies to run, then this might be a, my, a new achievement for me. The Pakistan has a lot of untouched territory. So yeah. I might get new achievements out of this. So personal achievements. So we'll see. Yeah. And hopefully that those achievements also help to serve a purpose for the conservation, education, and investigation of these animals. Yeah, that'll be actually really cool, I think. Because as you said, a lot of people in Pakistan don't understand a lot of the reptiles or snakes in general. So the information and the conservation of the species that instead of getting killed, they'll be relocated. So I think that'll be a great achievement just mm -hmm. for keeping animals as a whole. Yep. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's super cool, I think. <laughs> you yeah, really hopefully, I mean, if, for me, it will be a big sense of fulfillment, but not only for me or for the society, but for the animals mostly. I'm giving them a higher chance than if there was nobody here. Yeah. Um, so with that project, uh, I assume you guys are getting funding for that, or how does that work? At the moment, the uh, funding to start it up came from my own pocket, like coming to Pakistan and moving around, uh, getting to know people and stuff like that. 
that comes out of my own pocket. Now, this center I'm trying to build now, I have the support of the uh, Veterinary and Animal Science University, okay. or University of Veterinary Animal Science in Lahore, which is in the mi middle of the country. And they've shown the interest of me building a herpetological center for the for the purposes I've, I've said before, the educational yeah. conservation and research purposes. So they've been uh, su supplying the material to build it up, supplying the material to make it running out of their own funds. Uh, they made sure I, had, I don't spend anything. And if I do spend anything, bring it on along to them. So they are getting, they are right now, uh, the department I'm building it on, the grounds on the department I'm building it on. They are spending, they are funding most of the project. We are hoping to get the support and funding from the whole university board. So okay. this will be a bigger project and we will get more funding from it. As well as eventually might get the funding from the help from support from the government, the wildlife department at least. And apart from that, we are also looking for external funding. So we have, we have, a, we are looking like a different organization. Uh, at the moment, there's nothing confirmed yet, but we are looking like Ruffer or Save the Snake kind of organization to see if they would be interested. But I would rather have something solid to base my uh, project on. So I have the, like, okay. the, like the center up, up, up and running at the moment before yeah. appealing to them. Okay. Yeah, that, that's really cool. It takes a lot of time, and I assume it's pretty expensive. I'm not sure. Um, it can be expensive. It's kind of like bioactive. You can find, uh, to start off with, you can find effective ways to go around things in not too expensive fashion. But once you start getting more funding, then you can start to elaborate to have more sophisticated material and more sophisticated uh, uh, buildings. To have these animals, for example, right now, Pakistan resources are not that grand as in Europe or Canada or any other Western country. So resources is quite limited, and it's a very, uh, it's a very hard wall I'm bumping into all the time. When if, if I was in Spain, I think if I was in Spain, I would be able to put my hands on materials required for keeping reptiles properly yeah. without a problem. Here is kind of a problem because keeping reptiles is not a known, it's not a common practice. And keeping yeah. them properly is not a common practice. So there are many snake charmers, so they do keep snakes in captivity, but it's not a proper way of keeping them. Yeah. And the people who do keep them, they get the knowledge of keeping them from these snake charmers. So mm. it's still, they don't get the correct information. Yeah. They're getting the wrong information because just people don't know. So I'm kind of like revolutionizing the captive keeping with the center right now. I'm bringing the European and Western ideas to, to here, but again, finding the resources and the materials to cater for those ideas is not that easy. So you just need to work your way around it at first, and then eventually you can uh, purchase better equipment. Yeah, I, I would assume. I've seen some of the pictures that you posted. It, it looks like a, a lot of the buildings made out of cinder blocks and stuff like that. Yeah, it's pretty much cemented all. <laughs> uh, he's got he had enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, my wife's just coming home, so the dogs oh, come okay. every time <laughs> she comes home. So <laughs> they get excited. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so that's really cool. Um, I assume the construction of the building is probably going to take quite a while or? Yeah, I mean, the building right now is what we have. So it's not like I can't, I can't, it's, I don't have the funding and the power to tell them start from zero. Yeah. So, I mean, at the moment we'll do, we'll, we'll make do with what we have, but eventually once it starts becoming a big thing, then there's space for expansion. So we can always make better places. Okay, so did you guys start with an existing building then? Yeah, or? that's the thing. That this university they built this event uh, before with intention of having captive reptiles for educational purpose because it's a university for veterinary animal science. 
So they, the problem with Pakistan is they, the students from biology, geology do not graduate uh, with the knowledge of field work much. They don't, they don't know much about capturing animals in the wild, tracking animals in the wild, finding animals in the wild. So it's mainly lab work, what they're doing the experience on. Okay. So when I go with someone and say, hold me, can you hold this monitor lizard for me? They're like, mm -mm, mm -mm, what do I do? <laughs> so, so, so they don't have that experience. So this university has already started thinking ahead that we should have animals of different groups, mammals, birds, reptiles, fish. So as students studying this uh, wildlife, they, uh, get to know, at least get experience on what they have in front of them. So the only thing, they had mammals, they had some antelope, they had some deers, they had rabbits, <clears throat> rabbits. They were, they had some birds, pheasant, uh, pigeons, uh, different parrots, another thing. But they built this for keeping reptiles, but since before, like I said before, they had no knowledge on how to keep reptiles. And the knowledge they had on keeping reptiles came from people who don't keep them properly. So eventually, most of the reptiles died and the enclosures became a storage room for brooms and buckets and garbage pretty much hmm. so i i came and they were like oh, you're someone just like you so now <laughs> i started making those changes there but those were event initially built for that but they just didn't know how to run it pretty much yeah that's really cool because yeah you're sharing your knowledge with people that want to know but they just don't have the resources to learn. Yeah. So that's, that's really cool. Um, so with the environment in Pakistan, uh, it obviously varies from desert to very arid. Um, so does it get really hot there? Cause. Oh yeah. People... Summer. They're like looking at me like, you just wait till summer. And I, I'm like, I want summer. I want summer. I want hot weather. I want to look for snakes. And they're like, yeah, yeah, you just wait for summer. You'll get like 40, 50 degrees here. Easily. Holy crap. Celsius. And, and especially in the south. In the south, it gets really hot. In the north, for example, we're near the Himalayas, the northern area. So as you go north, you get more forest, more coniferous forest, pine forest, these kind of forest, cool areas. But as you go south, you get more desert and you get more sandy. Okay. So in the middle is where you get the dry, plains, hard soil areas. But yeah, it gets very hot here and it does get pretty cold. And it doesn't get as cold as Canada, for example, you get really cold winters. But yeah. Spain also gets really cold winter. And Pakistan does get really cold, but not like if we're looking at the Celsius, degrees Celsius. We, the minimum I got in the south was maybe eight, 10 degrees Celsius, which is okay, cold, but not too cold. And the noise you get maybe zero degrees or maybe minus four Celsius, still pretty cold. But the problem with Pakistan is they don't have uh, isolation, uh, insulated walls in the houses. Okay. So when you get cold, really cold winter, you get really cold houses. When you get really hot summer, you get really hot houses. So, it's just not, it's not a, a very extreme condition to live in. Yeah, compared to like here in Canada, our houses are heavily insulated because it gets minus 30 or sometimes <laughs> colder. So uh, I would die there. <laughs> uh, here, for example, in the, I was in the south in December. So I was like in the least cold area part of the Pakistan. So in the, right now I'm in the middle, but in December I was in the south. And for most part of the day, in the coldest day, I just used to sit in front of the heater. Just sit in front of that because I leave the place, I would freeze to death. So <laughs> even if I was inside the house. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's really cold here. So we're, we're really lucky because we got gas and all that fun stuff so to keep us warm yeah. in the wintertime. So most of us here are pretty lucky that way. Um, mm. So yeah, that's really cool. Um, so most of the native species in Pakistan, would they be crepuscular because it's not as hot during dusk and dawn then? In the summers, yes, definitely. They are more crepuscular, uh, nocturnal, 
but in winter in winter you wouldn't find any reptile that would be hiding but in the hottest days of winter for example you would find them in the peak of the noon 4 p.m 1 p.m getting okay. the hottest sun but in summer you would definitely find them mostly in crepuscular and nocturnal habitat yeah that's really interesting because uh, a lot of people think when they find these animals say like leopard geckos that they're just straight crepuscular but depending on the season that can change because they're adapting yeah. to the environmental changes i mean the professor I was talking to in the museum he's the one he might go to for leopard geckos he found one at the steps of his university that's so he found nice. a leopard gecko while leopard gecko running across the steps of his university and that was in the daytime in the morning granted it was early morning like 8 9 p.m uh, a.m sorry 8 9 a.m but it was still daylight so it's not like they are completely crepuscular nocturnal just depends yeah. on the conditions around them yeah it just depends when they want to go around and how long it took them to warm up to get their optimal body temperature yeah, so can... exactly so that's why the proper husbandry would be to give them all the choices so they can choose themselves when they want to be out and about yeah that would be the proper husbandry okay um that actually reminds me of some questions <laughs> that i had a friend ask me so for uh, husbandry and stuff um bioactive is probably more ideal because it's more enriching and stuff like that but um, mm -hmm. is it important to do nighttime drops for a lot of these animals? Because during the nighttime in wild, in the wild, it does sometimes drastically drop depending on what environments they're from. So, I mean, fluctuations in temperatures should be something to be considered. And if it can be uh, handled, uh, like a like, uh, captive keeping is a controlled environment. So you need to yeah. be careful to control those fluctuations but if you can manage it then it can possibly probably uh impact the behavior and the reproductive cycle of the animal and probably the the activeness behavior of the animal and it, i would reckon i'm pretty sure it would be in a positive way the impact it would have so if it can be done then there's no harm in that yeah yeah because as humans we want to be in control as much as possible <laughs> so like a exactly. lot of people... so for example in my case for example if it's raining outside in madrid i know that my reptiles can feel even in the house they can feel some kind of fluctuation pressure yeah in the air pressure so i just give them a little spray in water so it's raining outside it's raining inside you don't yeah, you're exactly. not free of the rain <laughs> no <laughs> As much as we want to control the environments in our homes as much as we can, they yeah. definitely can ch tell the differences in barometric pressure changes when storms come or winters are here and stuff like that. So, mm, exactly. Uh, like, like with my hog noses, I try to uh, bermate them for a period of time before I pair them up for breeding, which mm -hmm. hopefully I get some eggs out of my speckled hog noses and blondes. I've had some out of my uh, giants, but I have not had any luck with the speckled sore blondes yet so that'll be interesting uh, good luck with that yeah because i don't know anyone else who's bred the speckleds or blondes in canada but i could be wrong <laughs> so, but that'll we'll be find out now with the comments probably <laughs> yeah exactly so if anybody has information on it'd be great to share with me <laughs> but i haven't had any luck on much luck on finding other breeders on those mm -hmm. other two species the giants they've been bred in europe and here in canada um i know of two other breeders actually local to here in calgary that have bred them so well actually one's a medicine hat one's here in calgary so that was pretty cool that uh in within the, at least the last five years i know of those are the only people to produce them here so that was kind of neat uh, there's a few people in the states that have bred them mm -hmm. but have you bred any species in captivity since being a herpetologist or? I uh, bred a mostly keeper? common colibri. I bred a, 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 a crested gecko. I bred a corn snakes. I bred um, milk snakes, lamper pelties, king snakes. Um, 
uh, some native species in Spain, like the, the moose gecko, the house geckos we have in our houses. I found some eggs while I'm cleaning the house, so I just incubate them and they hatch. Okay. So, so those things, and but not anything majorly big. I mean, I've been working in a reptile breeding center in Madrid for one year. So it's just pretty much all the species we had there. And the ones out of all the ones we had there, I successfully managed to incubate and hatch out a uh, corn snake, milk snake, and king snakes, pretty much, and uh, crested geckos. That's still pretty cool. That's <laughs> uh, hog noses are the only species of snakes that I've ever bred so far. Um, okay, bred leopard geckos for a little bit, but I wasn't something that I wanted to continue breeding because there's a lot of other breeders here. And uh, mm. they had higher end stuff and more known genetics. So, yeah, you just don't know where to. I considered jungle carpet pythons because I really love that species. But the same is that that the genet genetically you don't know if what they have in them anymore. Yeah, kind of thing. So it's not. I didn't find it. I mean, I really like the snake, but I wouldn't go as far as keep a lot of them for breeding purpose. Yeah. So I, I, I did have one species, and that one species I do regret uh, giving away to someone else, but that's, uh, that's the thing. And, and I do hopefully uh, be able to breed spe uh, native species in Pakistan using this center. That way for whatever. And then also uh, convey to snake charmers, for example, because snake charmer is a tradition that yeah, it has a lot of negative reports and stuff like that, but I don't, since it's a very far back tradition, I don't see it stopping anytime soon. So if, I not, if I'm not, the way I'm thinking is if I'm not able to stop them, at least give them a proper information on how to keep the snakes in captivity, even if they're charming them. Yeah. So that means uh, uh, training the snake charmers how to keep snakes in captivity, how to handle them without being bitten and without needing to pull the fangs out or sue the mouth of the snake. Okay. Uh, and then captive breed them also that way they don't need to, if the snake dies, they don't need to go and take them out from the wild anymore. Yeah. You can just focus on breeding them. Yeah. So if they sew their snake's mouth shut, to me, that's not very humane, but do they, unsew it so they can eat so they continue to live or do they just sew it up and then they kind of just slowly some die? of them they might unsew it and so they can continue to eat and live in quoting but uh some of them they just sew it and then if, if it died then they will go back to snake habitat and get another one and even continue to eat they don't know how to feed snakes because I've seen how they do it. And uh, for example, this center that was explained to me how they fed some of the snakes they had before. Yeah. And they just got a piece of chicken, uh, chicken entrail, the underside, the inside of the stomach of a chicken, and yeah. with a stick, shove it down the throat of the snake. Ooh. And do that depending on the size, depending on how much kilo or grams they put inside the snake. But that's pretty much how they feed it, the force feed every time. That's not so, very nutritional. That, that's unfortunate. So, so it's unfortunate and education, I think it's a really on par with conservation and investigation for herpetologists. Education is a very important aspect on it also. Yeah. Uh, one of the comments here is uh, what native species does Spain have? That's actually a question I was also going to ask. Uh, or what group are we talking about? <laughs> Lizards, snakes, um, both? turtles? Probably a lot. We have 30. We have 13 species of snakes, and we have, uh, uh, of those 13 species, 10 are color birds, 3 are vipers. Uh, we have lizard, we have the wall lizard, podarsis. We have several species of that. I think we have three species of podarsis. We have uh, other lanthertid lizards. Uh, we have two species. We have a uh, oscillated lizard, uh, Timon lepidus. Uh, we have uh, one species of tortoise, one species of turtle. We have the invasive ones also, the red, red sliders, yellow sliders. Um, native, uh, we were talking about native. So native, we have one uh, species of freshwater turtle. We have one species of tortoise. We have 
few species of lizards and uh, maybe um, yeah, three podarces, uh, three lancertes, one timon lepidus, uh, and 13 species of snakes, three vipers, 10 colubrids. That's a lot more species of snakes than we have here in Alberta. <laughs> we have uh, six species of snakes, uh, one species of lizard. We do have some scorpions, which is pretty cool. And mm. we have the western painted turtle. So we got lots of garter snakes. Um, we do have uh, the prairie rattlesnake. So that's the one venomous species that we have here. Well, that's uh, a pretty cool. We have a rattlesnake. We don't have rattlesnakes. <laughs> Yeah, and we also got Western hognoses. Those are native to the province okay. too, so they're rear fang venomous. Um, but other than that, we have lots of colubrids. So we have like three. Or yeah, four we have the uh, grass uh, snakes. We have the ladder snake. It's the most common one in the southern hemisphere of Spain. Uh, we have the Montpellier snake, which is the largest snake species in the country, two meters long. Montpellier snake is rare fang also, and I call them the cobras because they they are they lift their head up and they are really big and really impressive, and they also can eat other snakes also. So I call them the cobra of the Iberian Peninsula. But uh, Montpellier snake, then we have the the horn viper, we have the aspid viper, we have the um, another viper species in northwestern of the country. And then the best species of snake, we have the water snakes also, vipering snakes, uh, escapian snakes, different species. Yeah, that's a lot of, quite a few. And now if I, start, if I start naming the ones in Pakistan, it will take a while. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody wants to know those, use Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cameras. They look like cobras. They have angry eyes. I've been looking into getting one. <laughs> the Montpellier snake. Yeah, they do. They are really cool animals. I think those are the only Spanish snakes that I really get excited when I find one. And they're pretty, they're like probably the second most common snakes in the country. That's really cool. How do they handle, like, uh, how do people in Spain handle snake encounters compared to Pakistan? Uh, probably kind of like what uh, we do. They do show interest. Like the educational side of it. Yeah. Yeah, they do show interest of it and they do like, they do show, they, I mean, I've been getting talk for years now and I've been getting little uh, snake shows and snake handling sessions and everything. So they do show interest, but it's not the same as uh, what, when you do it in Pakistan, because Pakistan, they're like, snake for them is just a big fang monster that's going to come and bite their face off. Yeah. So Spain, for example, we have the zoos which are more educational oriented now. So they have information there. They have snake shows there. The documentaries now, and reality shows on TV, Animal Planet, uh, Discovery Channel. They, to some extent, regardless how dramatic they may be, some of them, uh, to some extent, they're also educating people about these animals. So Europe, Spain, they're exposed to that. Pakistan is not supposed almost at all. So when you come with a snake uh, encounter, snake education show, and you, I haven't been able to uh, show them any real snake yet. So at the moment, I just showed them a presentation with PowerPoint and everything. And even that, their eyes and they become like, whoa. And then they surround me for another one hour to ask me tons of questions. So it's much more, they're much more, uh, interactive than when I do in Spain. And I do in Spain, they have some questions here and there, but when I come to Pakistan, it's like all of them have questions, so. Well, at least they're cool. willing to learn and uh, ask mm, questions. Yeah, that's the nice. willingness. That... So, yeah, that's, that's really cool. Um, in Spain, is there a lot of envenomation cases from the uh, venomous snakes or? Yes, yes, yes. They say like 40,000, about 40,000 a year snake bites. In Spain? Yeah, in Spain, sorry, no, sorry. Uh -huh. I was thinking of Pakistan. No, Spain, uh, no, Spain doesn't have that much envenomation. Not at all. Nope. We do have uh, some envenomation case, but it's not a big, drastic number. And it's mainly because the habitat of the only snake, uh, venomous snake we have, which is the viper, they mainly prefer 
rocky mountain areas. Okay. And we only have small villages in those areas. So snake bites that do happen, it's just mainly because a villager might have put a hand on a rock climbing a mountain or something, and the snake was there and it bit him. So they're very rare to occur. They do occur, but they're very rare and they are easily treatable. We have the antivenom for them. Well, at least it's easily treatable and the um, venoms are known, so that's uh, I mean, there different. have been death cases. There have been a few a few cases of death, but it's very sparse, very low numbers. Well, that's at least good. So that at least the people feel somewhat safer if they do get bit or whatever. So, but... yeah, because that since right now we have we already have the anti venom for the Spanish snake. A colleague of mine is working on a project on creating anti venom for the dogs. So they also get bitten by snakes when they get their nose in two things. Yeah. They go sniffing and they get bitten. So now he's working into creating anti-venom for dogs instead of only for humans. That's actually really interesting because like even in North America, um, a lot of dogs do get bit. And as far as I'm aware, uh, it's not very treatable for a lot of dogs or it's very expensive. No. So Yeah, I'm... because anti-venom for human doesn't work for dogs pretty much. So No, because that, that'd be a different... So um... it seems... Since I, it kind of like we have nothing more to do with the venomous snakes here, so let's do an anti-venom for dogs. For the next in the line. Makes sense. <laughs> so people want to keep their pets safe, and if they get bit, they want yeah. to help. I mean, it is a useful one. Them. Definitely a useful one. Yeah. Yeah. Because a, a lot of people have dogs. So, mm. and I'm not sure how many cases there would be of dog bites getting bit by snakes, but it's probably quite a few. So, yeah, there yeah. are quite a few, probably more than people in this case, because people, dogs that live in the mountain areas and villages, they tend to free free roam. Yeah. And then they get their noses and stuff, and people don't necessarily go up to climb a rocky area of the mountain, which is where vipers normally inhabit. Yeah. So, yeah, that's actually pretty cool. Um, so, I guess that answers all my questions that I can think of <laughs> off the top of my head. <laughs> that was a lot of information to take in. Um, yeah, that's good. I'm always um, available if you have any further questions. <laughs> um, how can people find you or ask you questions if they have questions in the future? So I have a, a, an Instagram where I have, when I'm pretty active in it, and every day I post a, I do a post on a, any kind of animal I find on my way and my adventures and my adventures. It's mainly reptiles, mainly snakes, but I also talk about an invertebrate I saw in my travel to Africa or a bird I saw in my travel to uh, South America or on a mammal I see in Thailand. So I will post something about it. It's all wild wild caught wild animals. So they can get me through there. They can send me a message in my Instagram and I will definitely uh, uh, definitely answer as soon as possible. And but yeah, I'm, at least one today I'm always in there. And they can get me easily from that. Okay. So I don't know if I should write it down or put it somewhere. Um, if you can send me the links, I can post it to the episode okay. so people can find you. And yep. would they just look up Sherry Bakari on? Uh, I mean, Instagram? my my Instagram name is Onward, like going going onward. Yeah. So Onward two, the number two, wildlife. So on way to wildlife. I follow that. So, <laughs> and everybody so, uh, else should, because he does post some really cool stuff from what I've seen, and uh, your adventures look absolutely amazing. <laughs> and I'm kind of jealous that I don't get to see a lot of the stuff. Well, you just need to get out there. <laughs> well, I'm hoping to go herping locally here in the province uh, in the summertime uh, for some bull snakes and uh, maybe some western hog noses. But I just want to look into our local laws first, so I don't make sure I'm not getting charged for harassing wildlife because our all our wildlife uh, yeah, is protected. That's a, that's a very big thing. So mm. I just want to make sure I'm going through the proper channels before I do that, so I don't get into trouble or whatever. Just in case a conservation officer comes up and is like, "Hey, what are you doing?" <laughs> so that's mm -hmm. just what what I want to do. Make sure I'm not going to get in trouble for that kind of stuff. But there's some yeah. stuff that I do want to look for. <laughs> So that'll be hopefully this summer if this whole virus stuff blows over. <laughs> yep. But if hopefully, I, I mean, I'm, I'll see if in May I can actually go back home because if the air, if there's no air, tra if air traveling is 
okay, fine, it's smooth and down, then I can go back home in May. But otherwise, if I can't, then my visa here is for another almost another six months, so I can just stay around and stick around, and hopefully, when the virus here blows away, I can go and look for some cobras and for some vipers. So, um, when you're herping in the field for venomous snakes and stuff, do you just use a snake hook? Yeah, I only use a snake hook. I do take a snake tongue sometimes. A snake tongue, I, I don't like using it, but I do use it in the worst case scenario, which is, for example, a snake is about to go inside a hole, inside a burrow, or in between rocks, or somewhere that I wouldn't be able to access easily. Then I just use the snake tongue to quickly grab him. Okay. But I won't. I don't like using it for long because it stresses the snake, makes them more uh, nervous because something caught them. Yeah. And if you use too much force, you might hurt the snake also. So uh, I like using the snake. Oh, that's the only thing I use pretty much. I just pull them towards me, tie them down, and once they're tied, then I can mess around with them. Mostly take pictures. This is what I do. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so yeah, follow Sherry on instagram um anywhere else that they can find you on at the moment it's only that i do have a youtube channel which has my name which is the channel is in my name okay. but i barely do any videos i'm mostly a photo person so i'm mostly doing what better place than instagram to post your pictures exactly. so that's, that's pretty much cool. what i do okay cool so uh, you can follow sherry on instagram at onward to wildlife um we'll post that to our uh episode once we upload that to podbean um and yeah and you can follow us on facebook instagram and podbean because that's the only places that we're on <laughs> so uh, we will be uploading this episode to podbean and you can check out the live video as well if you want to because that'll be uploaded to facebook thanks for coming on and i hope people learned as much information as i did because i did yeah. not know king cobras traveled two kilometers yeah, they do travel a lot. They can travel more if they wanted to. Oh, probably. It's just really <laughs> It's just really surprising on some of the things that you probably find out when you're doing your research. Yeah, you definitely find a lot of things out there. Yeah, so I mean, so. for me, I'm, I'm very glad that you learned a lot of things, and I'm hopeful also that the rest of the audience have found this entertaining and educational. So. I hope so. And I'm really excited to hopefully get you back on so we can learn more about the research facility that you're doing and how that Definitely. project goes on. So <laughs> maybe in six months or whatever, we can yep. talk back with you and maybe learn more too, because you might learn some stuff about native species and other things. Yeah, no, definitely. If things go well, I probably, I will definitely have more information there to share. So that would be good. Definitely looking forward, it, forward to yeah. it and your publication. That's going to be exciting too. So I guess we'll be signing off. Thanks for coming on. Okay. Have a good night. Or actually, care, good morning. <laughs> yeah, it's a good morning for you because it's like what? Uh, good night for you then. <laughs> yeah, it's what nine going on ten o'clock nine ten o'clock in the morning for you now. Yeah, kind of, almost ten o'clock. Yeah. Okay well, then. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Later. Bye.